Awesome. Yeah, but how is it living back there? Is Oakland like rough living back in like the place where it all started or? Oh, like emotionally? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I just don't really like it here. That's like the bigger problem. Uh, <laughs> I can handle living in places where I used to get high and all that. It's more just, it's just like really expensive and shitty. <laughs> um, I don't like that part. For sure, for sure. How's the book stuff been going, actually? How's that been going so far? It's going okay. I mean, it's obviously there's a lot of fear and just is this going to just sort of die down or die out? And uh, I mean, I've gotten some pretty big opportunities. I have some lined up, like I'm going to talk to Dr. Drew. Oh, uh, so that yeah. that'll probably it's and it's like that's a big opportunity, but it's more so an opportunity to continue going on other like larger platform. You know, if people hear that, maybe Adam Carolla will hear that i mean who knows you know so that it, it'll all sort of maybe a little joe rogan maybe if we get real with <laughs> well that, that that's what i'm hoping it, yeah. it could get to that point uh i know that if he just knew about me he'd be like i have to talk to this guy he was a homeless guy in los angeles like i just don't know how he'll uh, i just have to hope that he hears about it yeah he would love nothing more than just to rail on california for three hours with a homeless guy for sure. I have some questions about that, too, about like this is kind of like a writing and book podcast, but like, you know, we do all kinds of books and stuff. So I have questions about obviously your story and your life, but then like the actual process of writing this book for you and then like the tour stuff, because like we have kind of writers that listen a lot of like writer focus. They're always interested in that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm just I'm curious about your how DIY it is, you know, in terms of promoting this your own stuff nowadays and with books, even when you have a major press backing you and all of that. And, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's great, man. I'm glad that that's that's slowly but surely working out with uh, getting larger, larger. Thank you for taking the time to do my tiny podcast. Yeah. No, no, of course, on of Drew. course. Yeah, that's gonna be great. Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. This is Andrew Wittstadt, and you are listening to Heavy Board. And we're recording this on June 29th, 2024. My guest today is Jared Klickstein. Jared is a writer and independent journalist whose work has appeared in various outlets, such as the New York Post, among others, and owns and operates a Substack page, jaredklickstein.substack.com, also linked in the description of this episode, listeners where he publishes his independent work regularly. And most recently, Jared is the author of the new memoir, Crooked Smile, out now from Bombardier Books. And Crooked Smile is a book that chronicles Jared's life, his time spent on the streets of California, in the throes of the fully blooming opioid crisis, and also his recovery. The subtitle reads, what it took to escape a decade of homelessness, addiction, and crime. And Jared has been very open about his life and the realities of what it's like to be in the throes of an addiction, how it consumes all, what it takes from you, as well as what it gives. And he has quickly become a spokesperson of sorts, appearing on many outlets, sharing his story, including outlets like Fox, prominent podcasts, prominent YouTube shows, and has been placed as someone who has real world experience with the addiction and homeless crisis that has been gripping America. And he's never shy about what he thinks the problems are, using his firsthand experience to back it up. And Crooked Smile is a book that isn't just a memoir, but one that suggests solutions, calls out problems with the current system, and offers a glimpse into what's really at stake when it comes to the addiction and homelessness crisis plaguing American cities. The comedian Matt McCusker called the book a supremely fascinating glimpse into hell, and fellow independent journalist Lee Fong, previously of The Intercept, has said, for anyone seeking to understand the homeless crisis gripping America's cities, Klickstein's writing is a must-read. 
Born in Boston, Massachusetts, and raised mostly in Oakland, California, Jared has lived a life that we don't often hear talked about so openly, so honestly, the whole truth there for anyone to see. And because of that, Jared has also kicked some hornet's nests. But Jared's book, Crooked Smile, is a one-of-a-kind ride in and out of a wild life. And I'm thrilled to have him on today. Jared, thank you so much for coming on Heavy Board. Thank you, Andrew. I'm honored to come on. I always like to start this off, and with you, it's going to be an even longer question for the most part, with a kind of, what was your childhood like? How did you grow up? Yeah, well, my childhood was, I think it was decent. Uh, my parents were, my parents were heroin addicts, though, so that, you know, that there was a lot of hard drug use in my home. Uh, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I had good parents, though. You know, they were together, and uh, they weren't on heroin when I was born. They had gotten off heroin uh, some years prior and uh, mostly just, you know, drank heavily and, you know, partied and stuff. But they, they, they were relatively normal. Uh, but then I moved back to my dad's old neighborhood where a lot of his, you know, junkie friends were still kicking about. And uh, they, they actually got back on heroin when I was, you know, maybe four or five years old. So, um it was okay. I mean, it was very working class. My dad was a, was a union carpenter. My mom just sort of stayed at home and, and raised me. And, uh, we, ne I never really wanted for anything. I mean, we didn't live in a fancy house or a fancy neighborhood, but, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty decent, but you know, it, it got, it got rough. I mean, once my parents started smoking crack when I was like seven or eight, it, th that's when things got really out of hand. Um, you know, just general insanity going on in the house and, you know, hallucinations and, you know, they were hallucinating this, this whole reality and it's sort of, I, I was a child, so it was pretty easy for me to delve into that and sort of hallucinate my own reality as well. And were you, uh, were you aware of it? Like when you were like that young, were you aware of like the kind of, you know, your parents are smoking crack in like the living room or anything like that? You know, like were you, how aware were you at that age, you know, a young age to be yeah. Uh, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know that it was drugs. I didn't really know what drugs were. I didn't see them use drugs. Uh, probably by the time I'm like 11, I've, I caught them doing drugs a few times. And, and I, and at that point I knew what drugs were. So I sort of started putting two and two together. I, I assumed that they were smoking weed. I just, I knew what weed was. So I thought they were smoking weed cause it looked like they were smoking something out of a pipe. And I actually started finding pipes and, um, but, you know, it got really bad. So I, I had gone to D.A.R.E. class or whatever. So I, I thought, OK, they're they must be smoking something else, something more intense than weed. And, you know, eventually found needles and things like this. So it, it became pretty abundantly clear. And this was like the age of 11. You started putting this all together. You said around. Yeah, yeah, 11, 12. And then and then by the time I was 12, I was actually removed from the home and and uh was adopted by my aunt and uncle in Oakland, California. Was that CPS that came in and removed you or No, CPS came CPS came throughout my childhood like 9 to 12 they came a lot. <clears throat> but they never did anything. I mean, they, my parents, my, you know, my mom got arrested for drugs and then it sort of came out that she had a child so they they started snooping around and and uh you know, in my opinion, they should have probably taken me away then. I don't really know why they didn't. Um, but no, I actually told, I actually reached out to my extended family and said, hey, my parents are, you know, they're going to die if they keep living like this. Can You know, you guys got to come check this out. I don't know what's going on. And they came and then it was kind of like an intervention. And then um, my my it was agreed that my aunt and uncle would adopt or, or take me for like a month. And then my parents were actually both arrested during that like a day after that intervention and it sort of became like a legal matter. And, uh, I ended up living with my aunt and uncle from 12 to 18. And that was like, so you're moving entirely across the country. I'm an East coast guy too. I'm from Baltimore originally, but like when you move out on the West coast and just like the difference between East coast and West coast and it's always fascinating to me, like little things, but like, how was that? How was it when you were, okay, so now we have Jared coming through young age starting to be like, Oh, but I mean, I think this speaks to kind of how large the kind of crisis is right now too, where you said even, even back then, right? I think we're the exact same age, actually. You were born in 89. 
yeah. so was I. And it was um, this kind of, you know, middle class family, like middle class life. And then the parent, you know, just using drugs while still yeah. maintaining this kind of middle class. Like it's just, it's so, not that it's normal, but it is kind of, it's, it's, it's one of those unseen things for the most part that I think you capture in your work and your book and your life story, really, that, that it makes people confront this idea where they're like, oh, that's for stuff on the street. Oh, that's for, uh, you know, people that are homeless and tense or something. But like you, they don't think about how it's like, actually, it's your neighbor over here that has, you know, keeping up with house payments or whatever and is just a user all the time. And so then you have, all right, so Jared's moving to Oakland. How was that? How was moving to Oakland at that age and, you know, being separated from your parents and. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, it was very different. Um, I grew up in an area in Boston that was pretty, it was pretty middle-class, but it was kind of like the working class area of the town. And, you know, a lot of my friend's parents had drinking problems and it was pretty open. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people's dads did blue collar work. And, uh, you know, there was some broken families. I, you know, I knew I had friends that were raised by their grandparents and things like that. And, and then I moved to Oakland, uh, with my aunt and uncle and my aunt and uncle, uh, they're not wealthy, but they have some money, you know, they're probably, they're probably like upper middle class. And we actually, they, they live in a town called Piedmont, which is sort of encircled by Oakland. So, uh, no one's heard of it, but I just, you know, I just say Oakland because people have heard of Oakland, but, um, you know, it was, it was odd. It was like a town in the hills and no one's dad did any, there was no blue collar work at all, uh, amongst any, any of my friend's parents. Um, most of them worked in tech, uh, and made a lot of money because they were of that generation that got into tech, into tech pretty early. And, you know, people had pretty put together homes. There was no one else at my school that was raised by extended family or, you know, everyone had at least a one parent home. I mean, and even that was pretty rare. Uh, California was very different. People were a lot softer. People were very openly friendly, but sort of judgmental behind closed doors. And um, whereas in Boston, people are very judgmental openly, <laughs> but like friendly behind closed doors or, or, you know, however you want to put it. But, you know, people are very ag aggressive and abrasive in Boston, but very kind at the same time. And g genuine, they, they're just genuine. And um, people here are usually aren't. Uh, especially now, I mean, it's just getting to the point where, you know, this place is just getting worse and worse and people are just like steaming out of their ears, pretending that everything's okay. And, you know, trying to be friendly and while, you know, this, you know, I live in a city that's collapsing essentially. Um, right. and everyone just has to sort of pretend that everything's, you know, a rainbow right now. And it's, it's, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's. You know, that wouldn't happen in Boston. If, 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 if a city was falling apart in the Boston metropolitan area, people wouldn't be pretending that everything's okay. And so like in Oakland, those high school years and all of that, when did this start to, when, when did the drug use come into play in your life? You know, like, was there a point in time that you remember like your first time kind of being introduced to drugs or, or anything like that? Because I think we all, you know, there's like, there is a time, especially American life, millennials, almost everybody was doing weed, like drinking underage, you know, like, like this kind of stuff was just happening in high schools, right? Even cocaine, some, and all that kind of stuff. Was there a moment that you remember or could point to where it's like you started this or your first time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, in Boston, I had smoked weed a few times and, and, and I drank, I think once, you know, I was very young. I was, you know, 11, 12 and smoked weed a few times, didn't, didn't get high, but you know, I did get high like my fourth time. And that was actually the day that my parents got arrested. Um, and I don't know, maybe there was PCP in it or something. I, I hallucinated <laughs> for like 12 hours and, and couldn't walk. And, um, but I really enjoyed it. I mean, I really got to escape and, uh, you know, I moved out here and, you know, smoked weed and, and all that, but it, it was really alcohol about freshman year of high school, sort of drinking pretty heavily. And I, I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. I could drink more than most people. I could handle it, uh, I guess, better than my peers. And, and 
and I knew that my life would have to revolve around alcohol. I, I really enjoyed that it made me forget who I was and forget that I was the kid that was raised by my aunt. My parents were crackheads. So it just became like a necessity. And I, I made a pretty conscious decision to, to, to just do whatever I had to do. Any, any life direction that it went, it had to involve alcohol, uh, access to alcohol. So, uh, yeah, I'd say I was like a functional alcoholic in high school. And did it start with just like, you know, partying with friends, like going over somebody's house or was it just like, you know, hanging out in the park, like drinking or. I guess it started in the, in the park, I, I would imagine. I mean, we, we would go to this liquor store in Oakland that would just sell alcohol to children and, right. and, uh, and go hang out in the park. But you know, it, my friends would, most of my friends would drink if, if there was like a, someone's parents were out of town and they could have like a little party. Right. And that's the only time they drink. So maybe they drink once a week, you know, but, um, I was the guy that would drink in the park or drink in the porta potty or, or drink in the bathroom of like a, of like a grocery store. Like I, I just, I drank every, and there was a few other people like me and we, we gravitated towards each other and we would just drink any opportunity we had. Um, I drank every, there was not a weekend it for all four years of high school. I didn't drink. There, there wasn't a single weekend. And it, I wanted to ask you this too, because, okay. So you said it was kind of started with alcohol and some weed smoking. Like, what are your thoughts on like, there's, there's this kind of gateway drugs, right? Would you say that, do you think gate, gateway drugs are real? And if so, would you say it was like alcohol for you or something or your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think buying weed illegally and like having a dealer and a number and getting like a little baggie of weed and, you know, being secretive about it and getting high off of the sort of bad behavior of it all was a rush and sort of a gateway towards towards other things. I mean, when I first started buying heroin, it, it was certainly it's pretty similar to the process of buying weed when it was illegal. Um, now it's so different. I mean, now weed's legal. So kids just have a completely different experience. I, it, so it, it's almost like there's gateway behavior, I'd say. Um, and you know, I'm not going to, I can't, I'm not like a scientist. I don't know. I mean, I can't <laughs> say, I can't say that like weed leads to drug addiction, but, um, I mean, weed's a drug and I know people that are addicted to it. Right. And it's like the number one drug that if someone's addicted to it, they love to lecture you for hours about how they're not addicted to it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, but it, but you know, my uncle has smoked weed for like 50 years, almost every day. And he's never done heroin or cocaine or anything. So people are just people, you know, and, and you're kind of like, born with a pension to become a drug addict or not it's it seems like but i i don't like when people think that they know the answers to these things especially doctors especially people that have never done heroin and right. they see themselves as like experts on addiction uh which is most doctors you, right they've never done yeah. it yeah <laughs> no they've never done it and they're also semi-responsible for like the wave of the opioid uh, crisis and you know i i just the people that uh perpetuated the opioid crisis are probably not the best voices to you know sorry yeah no worries are probably not the best people to give us lectures on the process of of of, a, of mental addiction um so yeah the more you learn about addiction via direct experience the less you actually understand about it i'd say yeah. And I think that's, it's very fascinating to, to hear that too, about when you said it's more behaviors than it is like it, you know, like, is it really like, Oh, you're, you're smoking weed. So now you're going to start smoking crack, but it is like, it does kind of, that isn't necessarily true. Right. But it's like, if you're texting some random person, you know, and you have to drive into like the downtown area, if you're living in the suburbs or something and deal with like sketchy people, it kind of trains you into a behavior, but Oh, this is okay. Or this isn't, or at least, just makes you, I don't know, like, like less afraid of it or, or intimidated by it or something. But yeah, I was just fascinated because you're always so honest about this kind of, you've been here, we hear about gateway drugs all the time and your take on it is, I think, uh, interesting and, and refreshing and all of that as well. Yeah. Well, I, I'd say oat, like oat pills are for sure. I mean, a gateway drug in the, in the way that they're, I mean, it's literally heroin. I mean, if right. you're doing Vicodin or Oxycontin or anything that that is, uh, you know, without a doubt, 
going to lead you potentially to heroin addiction. I mean, that's how most, if you talk to any heroin addict in their thirties right now, uh, it's typically started with Oxycontin and, um, that, that's just a fact. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've almost never met a heroin addict that started with heroin and didn't start first with Vicodin or, or Oxycontin. Right. It's interesting too, because I grew up in it. Obviously I, I was not, uh, on the street or anything or addicted to heroin, but it was, you know, I grew up in the suburbs and it was, you know, I went, my parents were middle class, upper middle class. And I, I went to private schools and things and like the parties and stuff people were just snorting things. Like it was just commonplace, right? And not that everybody at that age was like, oh, I'm in the throes of an addiction, but it was just kind of how common that is when you're just in high school or something and you're just kind of, people are doing, you know, whether it's Adderall or like you said, Oxys or Vicodins or something that they're just crushing up and snorting during parties or whatever. Uh, it is kind of crazy when you think about it. I mean, I don't know. Is that a new thing? Like, did that was that a new thing when we were growing up? Like, I mean, people were always doing drugs, right? But like, was it just so ubiquitous when like the millennial generation and was really in their youth? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just I don't I'm not expecting an answer to that. But yeah, just thinking. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I know people. You know, like our our parents' generation probably did speed. You know, uh, what do you call them? Black, black black beauties or whatever, and all that. I mean, but but. Uh, there wasn't like this huge opioid pill situation going on until the 2000s. I mean, there was all, there was Vicodin, but um, yeah, we're, we're pretty unique in that there was just this explosion of pills that were in some way, you know, an 80 milligram Oxycontin is stronger than a, you know, a dime bag of heroin. And it's the size of a, you know, an Advil. And they were just handing them out to people. So yeah, we, we I think we did have a pretty unique situation. And uh, and then right now the kids are in a pretty unique situation that's even worse than the situation that, that we were in is in that there's pills everywhere but they're not real they're they're just like fentanyl pressed pills from the cartel and they look like Xanax or you know I even Adderall like I I know people that buy Adderall on Craigslist and it's just meth <laughs> you know and they end up in jail right. they like take an Adderall and end up in jail it's not it's not an actual Adderall so that that was not a thing when when we were there was no I don't think there was any counterfeit pills really when we were around. There was ecstasy and stuff, but there right. wasn't like fake Oxycontin. So we have you that, and then your high school years, you're getting into drinking and this. When, when did the kind of drug use start? Was that high school years as well? Kind of getting into, like you said, pills like Vicodin and stuff, and then into college or? Um, I, did, I didn't do like hard drugs in high school. It wasn't super available. I didn't really know a lot of people. I, I, I went to a school that was pretty serious academically, and people were people were just concerned with, you know, going to a good college. And, and, um, so it wasn't really huge there, but I, I went to UC Santa Cruz, uh, which is sort of like a loser factory. <laughs> and, um, even though it's somehow has a reputation of being, I think it, it has a better reputation now, but, um, it's not even that bad. It's just, I, I, I went to the art dorm, um, which was just like a building of losers essentially. And, uh, heroin, people were just doing heroin you know, freshman year, uh, it was everywhere. It was it really exploded. Um, especially in towns like Santa Cruz, like these small college towns on the way up from, you know, Mexico to up the West coast. These were sort of like the heroin highways of, of the West coast. Uh, you know, the cartel was transporting heroin all the way up to, you know, Washington, I'd, I'd assume. And it would stop off in these little towns and it just was flooded. And, um, and I knew what heroin was, so I, I didn't do it. I was actually pretty against it, but but there was a lot of oxycodone, and and I didn't know what that was. And people were snorting these pills, and I figured it was a pill, so I just started messing around with with oxycodone, and and I I got addicted pr pretty immediately. And yeah, it just totally exponentially grew quickly. Yeah, and you said I think if I'm rem remembering correctly here with my research that you. We're about over 10 years, right? Like 10 years of uh, being addicted to heroin. Yeah, I think I got, I tried it in when I was 19 and I got clean when I was, I think I was 29. It was six years ago. I think 29. Yeah, so 10 years. Yeah. And I was seeing in, as I was researching this, like you ended up working for the cartel for a while. A little bit. I mean, I, I don't, 
it that sounds a little i'm definitely <laughs> uh it's not an exaggeration it's just it, it when you say i work for the cartel it sounds like you were like carrying a machete and like an ak-47 <laughs> and and uh, i wasn't doing that but you know there, there it was almost like i was an amazon i was like an outsourced amazon driver it's like if you say i work for amazon but you really just work for like some little company that delivers packages and has a contract with Amazon or something. It was sort of like that. I just, you know, the cartel sold dope and they had street level dealers in Santa Cruz and, and one of them uh, hired me to be a driver. So I did that. Um, I just drove around Santa Cruz and, and dropped off heroin to, to, uh, to customers. And, and I had a walkie talkie and, you know, the customers would call this guy uh, I forget his name. It's it's in the book. I forget. I forget what it, <laughs> Hugo. His name was Hugo, and and people would call him and say, "Hey, I'm at CVS on 40th Street. I want this much or whatever." And he's he'd say, "Okay," and then he'd message me on the walkie-talkie and say, "Drive to CVS on 40th Street." I you know I just sold heroin basically for six hours a day. But he would require me. Well, my first day, he required me to do meth uh, because he was he knew I was a heroin addict and he didn't want me to crash the car. While I was driving, because heroin addicts are known to do that, they fall asleep a lot. So he, he required me to do meth to get the job, and uh, but he would only let me snort it. He said, "You can't smoke it. If you smoke, if I find out you smoke, you're smoking it, you're fired." <laughs> so um, I he introduced me to meth, and and I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I worked for him while I was doing finals, and was on meth. My for all my finals, I was on meth during, I wrote like a 50 page thesis or whatever. I did it in like 20 hours, you know, on meth. meth. I got a C minus on it. <clears throat> uh, I think it was probably a, f a failing paper, but my professor knew that I was, I told him I was struggling with, with a uh, heroin addiction. And, uh, I told basically all my professors that I was a heroin addict and, um, because they, they they gave me leniency. They'd say, okay, you can turn that in late, you know, right. which is crazy. I mean, they should have probably called the police or some, or <laughs> like, I mean, someone, um, you know, I, I was at my college, uh, therapist or whatever. They have like a mental health department and, you know, I, I came in there by junior year and I was like, Hey, I'm really strung out on heroin. And, uh, they gave me a prescription for Ativan. You know, so like that was their solution. Is that like a synthetic uh, opiate? Uh... No, it's just it's just Xanax, basically. Okay. You know, so uh, that's a really dangerous thing to do. You know, <laughs> someone addicted to heroin to like give them a Xanax prescription. Um, that was pretty irresponsible. But these people are morons. I mean, they're therapists, so already you're a moron. But then you're also a therapist for like a, at a college. So like right. you know, you're probably like. The least qualified person to be yeah i don't know i just i and have like zero my experience with that is kids would go to like the the campus therapist when i was in college to get adderall prescriptions or xanax yes. prescriptions yeah they're just dr drug dealers basically so uh they're there like one day a week usually like they come in for like a clinic and then they just start handing out like prescriptions to i mean like you said you were writing papers on meth it was like you know, it sounds crazy, but like, is it that far off? Like, I know people that were doing Adderall to write their papers for finals, you know, like well into grad school and stuff. In my, oh, yeah. 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 People still, I know people my age doing Adderall just to wake up. Right. Yeah. You know, go to their shitty job. So, it, yeah, I mean, these pe these doctors or whatever you want to call them uh, set a lot of people up to just be chronically addicted to Adderall. Um, I, I didn't ha I didn't ask for Adderall. I, I was actually saying I'm a heroin addict. I don't know what to do. And they were like. Yeah, we don't really know what to do either. Take some Xanax. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, that's another conversation. I just, you know, I I don't have any, I don't really respect therapists. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I you, rarely You've said this, I've heard, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I, I, I consider it the fakest job on the planet. I consider it an insult that ChatGBT hasn't replaced ther every therapist job at this point because uh, it's a fake job. So it's, it's just interesting that, um, why not give a fake job to a fake thing? Yeah. You know, uh, but that, Hey, that, those are just my, I guess, controversial opinions, but, um, but yeah, that's what this therapist did. And, and, uh, you know, no one stopped me basically. Uh, not that it's their responsibility to stop me, but you know, if you tell an adult at a school 
an employee that you're a heroin addict. I, I, I you know, it, to me, I think it should sound an alarm at some point. Right. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was literally like, I was trained as a college teacher. Like that's my background, like to teach English and stuff in grad school. And they train you for all these things. Like if a student comes to you or they write about something in a personal essay about like being abused or something, like there's like a training that they put you through is where you go and inform people about it. Like you're kind of obligated, you know, like, like as a public employee, essentially a lot of these schools are state schools, you know, like to inform the authorities or inform the therapy apparatus at the, at the school or whatever it is. So it is kind of crazy that, yeah, like, like, so you were in college, like if we're the same age, you were in college, I meant 2008 to 2012 ish kind of. Yeah. That was you know? 2007 to 2011. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just kind of crazy that we don't do that for when somebody comes to you and then says, Oh, Hey, I think I have a problem with heroin. And the response is to just give you another prescription. I mean, it is kind of crazy with the kind of the, the therapy state as some would call it, right. The kind of, and you've had a lot of experience with this too, where you, we've, you've, I imagine therapy was, was that a requirement when you were getting clean and all of that as well, like in rehab and then, uh, throughout the process that you've dealt with a lot of therapists, <laughs> like, yeah, don't yeah. Quite I mean, understand. I, in, I, I've been to like the fancy, re <clears throat> I went to the fancy rehab one time that had therapists, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, ultimately I ended up at like nonprofit, like almost like state rehabs, um, and there, it's not really therapy. It's just you have counselors that were also homeless drug addicts. And so it's it's more like conversation stuff about experience. And, and yeah, that, that helped a lot. And then I actually did have a therapist for like three, three or four years when I got sober. But he was a he was a former drug addict that got he, he was basically my friend. And, you know, he barely charged me anything. And, you know, he charged me thirty dollars an hour when we started and. And then he tried to bring it up to 50 and I did that for a while. And then I said, this isn't worth $50. You know, I don't want to do this anymore. And he said, okay, we'll bring it down to 30, you know, uh, cause it's like, I'm, I'm not paying you more than what I, I do. I have a real job. Like, why would I pay you more than what I make? You know, <laughs> you're just on the phone with me for 45 minutes. Why would I give you $200? Right. Um, cause you know, it essentially it was just like, you're a friend at that point, uh, that we just, and so I, I do credit him with. I guess helping me, I, I, I don't know. I can't say that it didn't help me because I did have a therapist in, and I stayed sober, but um, he didn't do anything. He just listened and uh, and had the experience of being a former drug addict and who had gotten clean. So, um, But I don't think a therapist that didn't have an ex any experience with being a drug addict would have been very useful for me. I mean, you just can't under understand it. You know, it's like getting raped and then just like processing it with someone that's never been raped, I guess. I, it right. just doesn't sound productive to me. Uh, I don't know. So, yeah, that's kind of the whole basis of like recovery programs is, is um, you know, it's like an addict working with another addict. You just kind of understand each other on right. a, almost like a cosmic level in comparison to, to an, another human. Um, and you go but, yeah, into, listen, sorry, uh, yeah, no, please. Go oh, no, go, no. Well, it, it, I, I don't mean to like just shit on everything, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, there's all these like experts that get paid a lot of money that don't know anything. And, and I'm, people would say I am the, of the, the level that like on the same level as like the foremost experts on addiction, just like any drug addict is. I mean, you go out on the street and you find a crazy homeless guy. He is an expert on homelessness. Uh, far more than any person that went to college uh, right. and learned about, you know, social studies or, or whatever, social justice programs or whatever, like, you know, just like a black person is an expert on being a black person far right. more than any person that has a, has a graduate degree in African American <laughs> studies. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I just, it's just funny that people go to school for eight years and pay $500,000 for an education on something that I if you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, 
you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. And I know a hundred times more than them, and I still know nothing. I know nothing about it. You know, there's, <laughs> I, I understand nothing. It doesn't make sense. I mean, there's people that were horrifically homeless and addicted for years that are able to turn their lives around, and then there's people that come from good families with every thing at their fingertips and and every rehab and every program and they they can't stay sober you know it's just that we don't understand this um do you almost did seems, you ever, seems random yeah this is for my own did, have you ever read anthony ketis's uh book scar tissue i'm a big chili yeah. peppers fan but yeah, yeah I, I did i did read i bought it when i lived at a i lived at a homeless shelter for about six months and, and i got it and i and i read it and then I relapsed and I sold all my book. I had like 20 books and I sold them for like $16 right. at the bookstore and bought heroin. But um, yeah, I love scar tissue. It was great. Yeah. I just, he has that scene where he talks about like his first stint in like the rehab situation. And I just, I've always remembered it since where he talks about just like when he was there, you know, whatever, 15, 20 people in a room and the counselor, like obviously the counselor was a first, you know, former addict was just saying look around the room at everybody sitting here he's like only one of you will not be back here you know like, only one of you will stay clean out of like yeah. all of you sitting in this room right now trying to get clean yeah and like all of that i was just like wow like that is it's a power that like yeah like you said it's, it's really difficult to grasp the power of 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 those drugs and the addiction and all of that like what it's so hard to 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 put into scientific terms like people are trying to put like it into like a science term or something, you know, like, Oh, this is human psychology or, Oh, this is a medical issue or something. And you're just kind of sitting there like, I don't know, man, <laughs> like that there is a pull, like something within you, like Anthony Kiedis even says, and this guy was a fucking millionaire, <laughs> you know, doing it. Yeah. Like he couldn't, he relapsed. Like if, like, if, yeah. you, if you had a billion, if Jeff Bezos became a heroin addict, there's no amount of money that he could pay to not be a heroin addict. Right. You know, you can't buy it. Uh, you can buy almost anything, but you, you can't buy that. Uh, and almost uh, most of the time, it's actually a detriment to have money. Right. Uh, that typically hurts you. Yeah, you've you said do have this access before. To a lot of money. Yeah. Because cause I guess because you can just keep buying it and buying it until you kill yourself essentially with it. Or... Yeah, or your family will just keep putting you into these fancy rehabs that cost a ton of money that, that don't fix anybody, usually. I mean, the, the success rate is... I don't know. I've seen numbers where it shows that actually the success rate is really just the same across the board, no matter what, you know, it's just, it's like 5%. But, yeah. but, um, but you know that, yeah, when you're sitting in a room in a rehab and there's 30 people or let's say, to, you know, 20 people and you know, it's like one of you, one of you people will make it this time. It, one of you, one of you will make it this time, but you know, the 19 of you will come back and then one of, one of the 19 will, will make it. So it's not like right. the real success rate, is it 5%? I, I think it's higher. It's just that that every round you try, you got like a one in 20 chance of, of making it. And sometimes it takes six rounds right. and then you're, and then you're finally, it's like a lottery. It's like this time you're one of those, the one out of 20 people, but a lot, a lot of people die before that happens. And I think uh, this is why your voice is so important on this matter too. I think, because I think like so many people aren't willing to be honest about this too. I, me I remember listening to one, uh, another, former addict that wrote a book and an interview I was listening to, God, I wish I could remember his name now, but I'm just thinking of it where he talks about, he had that situation where his father was kind of wealthy in LA, you know, executive or a lawyer or something like that. And so every time he would go to rehab, they'd be like, you know, he was asked, what did that feel like? He's like, what did it feel like? He's like, I felt like a fucking rock star, dude. He's like, I would get arrested. He's like, and then within two days I would be on a plane, sunglasses on, getting a mud bath, you know, at this fancy rehab getting massages yeah. and stuff. He's like, I felt like a, you know, Mick Jagger, like just like, you know, walking yeah. out of a plane to this stuff. And he said, and it never worked until, you know, until it did, right? Until it finally did work. But just crazy that there's something there that's just unable to be, or we have, we're not studying it correctly or we're not even looking at it the correct way. And that's why I think, yeah, your book and, and your story is so important to this. But I wanted to ask, you know, 
how long when you ended up on the street and when i was researching this you said it was post kind of you were post college you were working for you know kind of a low level drug dealer for the cartel kind of delivery guy right like delivering heroin how did you end up on the street and how long were you on the street uh yeah let's see but, but well i worked for that guy for like a month and then i actually started smoking the meth like he told me that I couldn't do and and I immediately kind of lost my mind and got pretty conspiratorial and started accusing him of some things, you know, like conspiracy stuff and and then he knew he he said, "Okay, you're smoking meth." Like I can tell you're you're crazy. And, and he fired me. And that was my source of income. And uh, I didn't pay rent that month. <clears throat> um my lease was up. My family was pretty my aunt and uncle were pretty suspicious that, at that point. Uh you know, it all fell apart basically. And I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't pay, I couldn't go get a new place. I had no money. I fell in with some sort of methy people in Santa Cruz and they were homeless. So I just became homeless. I actually had a car at the time. Actually it was my aunt's car. I essentially stole it. And that's why she didn't talk to me for 13 years. Um, and I, you know, I lost that car uh, pretty, pretty quickly, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I slept outside for the first time in Santa Cruz, California, and uh, and then I called my aunt and uncle in Los Angeles, a, a different set of aunt and uncle, and uh, they said, we'll give you one shot. You have health insurance through your college, so we'll get you into one of these fancy rehabs, and you'll your life will turn around, and that will be it, and you know, that's what happened. I went to this, I went to LA, I got into this rehab, I got high like seven times, they kicked me out, and my aunt and uncle said, you know, we're never going to talk to you again if you screw this up. And I screwed it up and they kept their word. And, and I was in Los Angeles. And and when you're homeless in Los Angeles, you, you sort of just gravitate towards Skid Row because that's where you can buy drugs if, if you're a homeless drug addict. And uh, I lived on Skid Row at 20 at 22. I ended up there and I lived there for like six months. And uh, <clears throat> it was pretty scary and pretty frightening. And people were, you know, trying to fight me and trying to take advantage of me and I was a college kid that wasn't very intimidating and it was it was pretty rough <clears throat> I immediately found or I I immediately discovered that you sort of had to develop friends and a crew and and I fell in with like a group of Mexican ex gangbanger guys that had tattoos all over their body and had been on Skid Row for a while and knew the ropes and you know they didn't like me but I displayed my worth to them. I stole a bunch of socks and some supplies and I'd, I'd give it to them. And I made it very, and then I, I actually stole a laptop at some point and, uh, asked one of them to help me sell it. And he did. And we sort of struck up a conversation, became friendly. And he, he was very impressed that I stole this laptop and, and realized that, Hey, I could actually be an asset to, to him. You know, I'm pretty good at stealing things because of the way I look and I can just sort of get into places that, Un undetected unlike him who was like a dirty homeless guy who had been homeless for a while and had face tattoos and stuff so right. it, you know it wasn't super easy for him so that's how i got into that crew and i was with that crew for probably uh like a month into my homelessness so yeah you know, like five months i was with that crew were you just like <clears throat> sleeping in tents and stuff on like in skid row or like little makeshift you know places yeah we, we had tents um you know, mo a lot of homeless people like share tents or whatever. We, we all, I had my own tent. We did pretty well. We were a good crew. We slept on a freeway overpass about five blocks from Skid Row. So that was our spot. Um, back then, if you slept on Skid Row, the cops would come at like 5 or 6 a.m. and make you break down your tent. You'd have to break down your tent and carry your tent around every day. Um it was actually pretty difficult to be homeless back then. It was like 2011, I think. Two, yeah, I think 2011. Um, so we we actually slept Skid Row adjacent because we could keep our tents up all day, and then someone would always be in the area to sort of keep an eye on all our tents. And uh, yeah, I, I had a I actually had a lot of fun. It, right. it was pretty good. Uh, it was pretty lucrative. I made good money. Um, yeah, had a fun time. And I think that's what's important too is that you're very honest about like actually it was a blast, right? Like <laughs> you know, like it yeah. was a lot of fun actually to do this. And I think that's an underrated 
point is like, oh why do people do this well it's fucking a blast dude i mean like you know you're you was there like a freedom did you feel like free like kind of and yeah. at that stage of your life at least you know like yeah well and, and i was doing um <clears throat> i was doing heroin but i was doing a lot of meth and meth does give you the power to sort of get through anything uh it it is well, first of all, if you don't sleep, you know, meth makes it so you don't sleep. And if you're not sleeping, you're not really homeless. You're just sort of out having a good time. I mean, you, you know, you, you sleep like once every four days. So you're really just homeless one out of four days. And the other right. times you're just kind of out adventuring. And uh, meth really helps. And that's I think that's why a lot of homeless people do meth. And a lot of people that do meth end up homeless because you also lose your mind. And, you know, you're not going to pay your rent. You're not going to keep a job you become a crazy person. So it's pretty hard to maintain living inside when you're on meth. And you've also talked about the kind of the, 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 at this time when you were in college with the kind of the Occupy Wall Street movements that were happening. And, and these, and not just that, but larger protest movements that we've seen over the last, you know, decade or so, where you've kind of talked about how uh, drug addicts and, and stuff will take advantage of these big mass gatherings to some way. And it's always very fascinating to hear you kind of go into um you know everyone talks about like it's in the news all the time or the most recent riots kind of in 2020 and stuff where there's like these occupy movements where they're occupying a piece of like an area and everyone's like oh it's you know it's mostly peaceful because there's people out there with signs singing songs or whatever but then there's also this kind of like you know theft um you know it gets gets taken over very quickly by kind of like illegal activity or, or you know drug addicts and, and stuff like that but i just yeah, go into a little bit about that in terms of, because I think it, it's an angle that I think is people don't want to admit that like when you have a group of people out there kind of just, you know, sleeping in this area, not leaving, occupying this thing, and they're allowed to, that it's ripe for these kind of opportunities. And I think that, that you're one of the people that talks about this, I think, very honestly, and I think it's just incredibly fascinating like how that dynamic because you know it's not like oh it, it did anything the dynamic just kind of sets itself up for it and then yeah sorry i don't mean to keep rambling yeah no no it's okay uh no no you're, you're yeah exactly you're, you're that, that's correct um yeah occupy la was happening during my initial descent into descent into skid row living and uh and occupy la was right next to skid row actually it was in downtown los angeles and you know a lot of people had graduated college the year prior and the economy was really bad so they probably didn't have jobs and and um there was like this i don't know a thousand people in, in front of uh la city hall who were there for the occupy wall street protest and and um and i sort of just wound up there as a coincidence right right around the same time and and you know i, I went there and and i looked like someone that should have been there as a protester you know i looked like a college kid uh, but very quickly, you know, homeless people from Skid Row started moving in because they saw it as a – this is the bottom line is that it, on Skid Row, you had to break down your tent every day. And at the Occupy Wall Street protests, you didn't. You could leave your tent standing all day. And, and that makes being homeless a lot easier because then you don't have to carry around your tent. So immediately that that's sort of the reason why a lot of people went there. <clears throat> Second of all, they were handing out <clears> – <throat> they were handing out free tents that were – in better condition than the tent that you may have had on Skid Row. They were also handing out food and all kinds of things. So it was naturally, you would obviously go there. And then, uh, third of all, there was a lot of victims. There was a lot, a lot of potential victims there. So, uh, that was, you know, the, the reason why I went there and that's the reason why my little crew w would go there because there was college kids that first of all, they wanted to buy drugs. Um, whether it, maybe it wasn't heroin and meth, but maybe it was cocaine or something. It, it, there was people to rip off. There was people to rob. Uh, that's where I got that laptop where I initially proved my worth to, to these guys. And, and th there was like rich college kids that were LARPing as revolutionaries sleeping in tents and, and, uh, they had money and they had all kinds of stuff. And, and then it got really dark and then, you know, gangs started moving in. There, there's, there's a gang culture of, of Skid Row to some extent and uh, gangs started moving in and that's when violence started happening and, you know, rapes became pretty regular, you know, women getting drugged and raped or just, or just raped. There's a lot of screaming going on and 
then there was a lot of accusations of rape. You know, someone who just didn't like somebody, some homeless guy would fight with another homeless guy. And then all of a sudden you'd yell, I caught him raping someone. And then everyone just like, you know, pummels this guy. And, right. you know, it's just, it gets like, and then they're, and then they're formed like almost like warlords, you know, sections of this Occupy area. There was like different clans and warlords and, and uh, it, it got pretty weird. And, uh, and then there were stab, and then the stabbing started, right. and and it, it and that's when the police really came in and just broke it all up because it was like this has morphed into something that's pretty dark. Yeah, I think so yeah that, I mean, that happened. <laughs> we saw it play out. I think even just in the, the kind of the occupied zones during 2020 and 2021, and kind of the Antifa stuff, where I think that you put your finger on this, the key dynamic of that, where people would be like, oh, it's mostly peaceful, mostly peaceful, because there would be these groups of college students singing Kumbaya. But then there were also this other thing that you know nobody really wants to talk about besides you and a few other people, where it's like, no, actually, it's ripe for kind of gang activity because it's so kind of lawless. It kind of, and then there's all these college kids that their parents are giving them money or they have kind of access to drugs and things. And it is kind of, it, it explains the night and day situation in all of these places so much better than anything else I've heard, <laughs> you know, like it, yeah. it just kind of, and not even like well, it's planned. Yeah. It just happens. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Well, that, that, that's what the 2020 stuff I think was way more dark. Uh, you know, the Occupy movement was something that most people could actually get behind logically. I mean, it was just, it was a pretty unifying movement. Uh, you know, the 99% or whatever. I, I, I was on drugs. I didn't care about any of it, but, but just looking back it there was at least some kind of sensical structure to it all. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of the powers that be got pretty frightened by that. And as you see, after the occupy movement there, there was an explosion of like racial politics and very divisive, you know, uh, gender politics, uh, sexual identity politics, things that, the only things left to divide, you know, normal people, the 99% were, were fully implemented by corporate America and uh, Hollywood and all that. And, you know, is it a conspiracy that this was done on purpose to divide people? Maybe, you know, it's sure it is a conspiracy, but uh, it's definitely possible. Um, you know, there weren't communists at Occupy. I don't remember any communism talk at, at Occupy. There, there was almost like a there was even some like libertarian talk right. at, at Occupy. Or, or, yeah, but, um, or like I'd say leftist libertarian, but, um, you know, things got 2020 was, was dark. It was a lot darker. It was a lot super divisive. And, and, uh, you know, what some people would call, uh, there's a comedian named Kurt Metzger who was coined the term, uh, intersectional car crash. So <laughs> it was like these events where, if it had been 2011, it would have just been everyone singing Kumbaya, but then you show, it's just like the Palestine and the gay pride thing. It's like, you know, we have a gay pride march and then all of a sudden the Palestine people show up and they're saying there's no, there can't be any pride while there's like a genocide happening. And it's like these two people that should be allies are having an intersectional car crash. And, right. uh, and 2020 was, was, uh, there was plenty of intersectional car crashes. Um, and then obviously it just, way more lawlessness i mean 2011 there was a sense of law in places like los angeles and in oakland and all that and uh that completely went out the window in 2020 yeah. and has uh lingered yeah <laughs> i mean it's lingered where i live i mean la's i was just in la it's doing okay uh but where i live there is essentially you can commit crimes with no with impunity um as long as you don't murder somebody uh you can pr or rape somebody uh, uh, you can do whatever you want here. <laughs> wow. uh, yeah. It's a miracle that most people actually, it actually does make me feel pretty uh, optimistic about humanity because you can do whatever you want here and most people are following the law. Right. It's actually kind of a beautiful thing. I mean, you don't have to get a license plate or register your car or get insurance and all that. And you don't have to do that here. There's right. zero consequence for not doing that. But most people are still doing it. <clears throat> So that that's actually a pretty positive thing I've noticed about here. Yeah. That's one thing I noticed between the East Coast and the West Coast, honestly. Like I where I grew up, like if you didn't have your car registered, you were getting pulled over, like within the day. Like if you didn't have it out here, yeah. I see people with unregistered car like unregistered cars 
all the time. I'm just like, what the fuck is different about out here? Is they just don't pull you over for it or what? Or you just don't get arrested for it. It is kind of crazy for something small like that too. Yeah. Well, here where I live, you, the cops can't legally pull you over for that. Wow. Yeah. They cannot, if you don't have a license plate, the cops are not allowed to pull you over. Um, which, I mean, it just wasn't like that. It just wasn't like that 10 years ago. Right. I was no. going to say, I wonder if you said the difference is that like some of these laws in terms of kind of allowing people to set up their tents all the time, right? Like where you said back in 2011, they would make you break it down and you had to carry it around. Whereas now they don't, they don't make you do that. So it just allows, it just makes it easier for everybody to, to participate in that kind of stuff. And it is kind of crazy for that. I was going to ask you yeah. about this too, where the kind of, because of what you said about this, <laughs> you, you've not that you have a reputation for it, but this kind of like controversy, right? You've been kind of uh, follows you around where people are calling you kind of a far right fascist or, you know, any kind of, you know, pick, pick the label uh, yeah. because you'll say things like this. Um, so I was going to ask you, like, uh, why do people call you that? <laughs> why are people upset with you, with you, uh, speaking the kind of honest reality of, of, of addiction and, and life on the street. Yeah, they, they certainly, they certainly do. Uh, some people, I'd say it's a minority of people, but they're loud. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I missed 10 years of hi American history. Like I was just unconscious basically from like 2010 to 2018, you know, so eight years. Uh, I woke up in 2018 to a pretty different world than when I fell asleep in 2010. Um, I'm just talking about my experience of being homeless. I mean, that's really just it, the things I say now are just totally normal things someone would have said 10 years ago. But uh, there's like this whole apparatus of uh, I don't know what you'd call it. I just I mean, I just call them communists. But, um, you know, they're like <clears throat> they their career depends upon homelessness right. uh, their career depends on chaos I mean they work in like the nonprofit industrial complex in various cities like San Francisco and you know their six-figure paycheck relies upon this problem getting worse not better uh, so naturally they hate me because I'm uh, I'm an enemy to that I mean a guy that was homeless in the tenderloin in San Francisco that was able to get out of it talking is not good <laughs> yeah. know, it's not good for them. Uh, so and criticizing some of the conventional wisdom of kind of harm reduction. And I know you, you have more nuanced takes on harm reduction too, in terms of like the label, you know, like, like there are some good parts and then there's some really awful parts in terms of like the current consensus and like policy and law and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course I'm not, I, it, they, they, they play a lot of word games, you know, um, you know, harm reduction, who would be against that? Right. You know, of course, I'm not against reducing harm. Uh, Anti-fascist, I mean, who, of course, who would be against that? I'm <laughs> against fascism. Uh, but they, they use these terms conveniently to represent things that the words don't actually mean. But it sounds like you're a Nazi if you're against it. You right. know, so, uh, you know, harm reduction, I'm not against reducing harm. Uh, I was pro needle exchange. I mean, even though that's where I learned how to shoot heroin, you know, by like a right. college kid you know, a college kid that has never done heroin in their life or a, or a art history major or whatever you want to call it, um, handed me a pamphlet on how to properly shoot heroin. That's how I learned how to shoot heroin. Uh, I'd never shot heroin until that day happened. Uh, I don't blame them. I would have ended up shooting heroin anyway. And actually it's probably, and then this is the argument that would support them is that, well, it's better that I learned from a pamphlet than figured it out mm -hmm. myself, I guess. But, uh, so, so I don't mind these things. I, you know, you can't like, you really can't, I get it. You can't force someone to change their life, but uh, you can incentivize them to. So right. if you are handing out things like free needles or needle exchanges, I, I'm not against that. I mean, needles spread to HIV. I mean, I think it's good that people uh, aren't. I, I think it's a good thing to not spread HIV. But right. if you're just yeah. if you're just handing out needles and saying go for it and not giving them any options of saying like, hey, here's your needles. Don't spread HIV. But if you if you're done living like this, this horrible life. Uh, we have some resources for detox and, and uh, you know, long-term treatment. Uh, now, that, that's how it used to be, you know, at these needle exchanges. Right. I've, I've gotten into detox through needle exchange before, uh, but that's not how it works anymore because de no one's making money off detox uh, because detox requires a lot of 
work and infrastructure and you have to pay people you know, good wages to work at these detoxes. It, it, you can just make a lot more money if you just hand out crack pipes. Right. Uh, if you just get like a $2 million contract from the city of San Francisco and you and your two friends hand out crack pipes, I mean, that's a lot easier. I mean, it, listen, it's hard. I get it. It would be hard for me to not do that. I mean, I would right. never do that, but I get the, I get the draw of that. Um, so we're basically like farming homeless people. Uh, to extract like wealth from the city off of the lives. These are human lives right. uh, and they're dying and, uh, but we're extracting wealth out of it. So, and, you know, which is disgusting. Um, but these people live in, have to live in a family. It's like Nazis. It's like if you worked at Auschwitz, you had to tell right. yourself a lie. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. I don't think a lot of those, a lot of those, the Nazis were probably, or just, you know, lower level, like members of the party were probably had to tell themselves a lot of lies. Right. You know, um, I'm, I'm sorry to compare these people to Nazis. They're, they're not, <laughs> they're, they're much, I'm sure they're good people. Um, I'm sure they mean well, I, I'm, I don't, you know, that's a horrible comparison, but, uh, <laughs> in, in an overused comparison, I, I kind of feel right. guilty for, for just doing that. But, uh, yeah, well, I've met these people. They they're not evil. Right. Some of the people at the top may be, but uh, you know, these are just losers. Right. That mean well. That's mostly what it is. And they probably don't quite understand, right? Like cuz like you said well, they, they just don't, don't understand. Yeah, they have no experience yeah. with this. They have no idea what the day-to-day -day life is and kind of even that kind of even if you wanted to stop and you can't, right? Like this kind of it's it's very hard for people to understand. I mean, I even struggle to understand cuz I've never had that kind of pull right like in my in kind of a spiritual pull you've said and i want to get to this too but uh what would you say is the most misunderstood part of addiction in terms of like people like that on the outside kind of looking in yeah um it's a without a doubt in my, my mind uh it's a spiritual malady it's not scientific it's uh it's uh it's almost disrespectful to label it something as small as scientific i mean to label it a disease is insulting it's it's right. just it's so much bigger than that it's it's cosmic uh it is a spiritual issue it seems uh that's what now that's just from my experience that's from I mean, if you talk to most people that have been able to get off this it's a lot of them are in agreement about this at least the ones that i've met it's just it, it is um something that can't be understand broken down into like human scientific terms. Um, it, it requires a complete psychic change of, of everything. Um, it were, and, uh, it's, it's one of the few things that if you, the more you quote unquote, help someone, you're actually hurting them. Uh, because help or quote unquote help in the eyes of someone that isn't a drug addict, um, looks a lot different than someone with experience with it. Um, people use drugs and they ruin their lives and they hit a rock bottom. And, and a lot of these people that don't understand addiction, their whole policy is like, let's put a pillow down there. So when they hit rock bottom, they land on a nice fluffy pillow. Right. And that, that sounds really nice and it sounds really compassionate, but, um, that actually doesn't help at all. It actually makes things a lot worse. And, uh, it's not just the people that, are in charge of these policies, but it's actually the, the for-profit rehab industry is exactly the same way. Uh, they want to make money. And the way you make money is that you have someone stay at your rehab for 30 days. Uh, I've worked at rehabs and, and what people don't realize is that it's actually pretty hard to get someone to stay at rehab. Right. Uh, they usually come in and once you say you can't do drugs, they, they, a lot of them want to leave. Right. So how do, you, how do you get someone like that to stay? at your rehab while well, you give them a hot tub and you give them Pilates classes and you take them to magic mountain so they can go on roller coasters and, and you give them a ton of drugs. I mean, you don't give them heroin, but you give them a lot of Seroquel and all this Ativan and all this, and you drug them up. So they're not a problem. And then they stay for 30 days and then you get to bill an insurance company, $30,000 or more. So, uh, that system doesn't work at all. Yeah. Uh, so th this is what people don't understand is that, you know, you're dealing with someone that's like psychotically under the influence. They're not making decisions for themselves. I mean, they are they, they are under the spell of, of a drug. 
Right. And uh, you're just dealing with the drug. So you like trying to re you're not going to negotiate with fentanyl. It's just not going to happen. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I say that we should just lock everyone up in prison. Right. I mean, <laughs> it, obviously, that, that doesn't work either. So it's like, what's what are, what do we do? But we have to do everything we can to incentivize people to change their lives. And we have to stop rewarding uh, them for not changing their lives. I mean, you can't reward fentanyl. Rewarding right. fentanyl just leads to more fentanyl. It's never going to end. It's never going to lead to less fentanyl. Right. You know, you couldn't reward me. And I mean, maybe, you know, if you said, Hey, I'll give you a hundred grand a month to stop doing heroin. I might've been able to stop doing heroin. I think I could have white knuckled it and stopped. Right. But, uh, we can't give everyone a hundred thousand dollars a month. <laughs> Um, I, th this is something you've written about, I think that, that is, that is, and others have written about this, but you've written about it from your perspective in a really, really great way where the kind of, you know, the, the, the consensus right now, at least the political and policy consensus is, oh, we need to build more shelters. We need to build more homeless shelters for people where you've made this point often where it's like, we don't necessarily have a homeless problem as much as we have a drug problem, you know? And when you build these shelters, they don't want to go to it because you can't use in the shelter, you know? So like these shell, even if we built more, uh, you know, how do you get people to come to them, you know, like get them to stay there and not be on the street when they can't use in the shelter, you know, that's why they're not coming. It's like, it's the point you always make about how it's being misunderstood. Like the actual issue is being misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, and it, what, what made you want to write a book about this? Um, well, it, when you're homeless for that long and you're doing drugs and you're getting into these crazy situations and you're going to jail and having all these crazy wild scenarios, uh, you know, you come up with, uh, you have stories, you have really good stories. And, and, uh, you know, I always remained pretty close to like my high school friends and some of my college friends and who didn't end up drug addicts. And, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd tell them these stories and, and almost, almost everyone was just saying like, Hey, you should really write a book. These are pretty intriguing uh, I've never heard anything like this. And, and you seem to have not fried your brain to the point that you're actually able to tell these stories. So people kept saying that to me and I kept, you know, in, the, I was like in the situation where it's like, well, someone just needs to come to me and like pitch me like a thing, how they can help me write a book or write a TV show or like, you know, someone has to do it for me basically. Like I'm the, I bring the stories to the table and someone else has to bring everything else to the table and, you know, just a very self-centered, immature outlook on it. And, and then, uh, I, I met a guy that actually had written a few screenplays and, and was sort of involved in Hollywood. And I said, how did you do it? Like, how do you even do this? Like, like, how do you become a writer? And he just said, um, he said, well, you just write, <laughs> you know, that, that's what he said. And, and I know that sounds dumb, but I said, okay, okay, well, I, th it sounds like I'm just going to have to sit down at a computer and start writing, which is obvious. You know, that's yeah. how you become a writer is that you write. And, uh, um, so I started writing and, um, I wrote this memoir about all these you know, I finally cleaned up and was actually able, I mean, I, I attempted a few times before I cleaned up for good and it, you know, I could never even hold on to a laptop, let alone, uh, you know, write a book. But once I did get clean, I, I finished the book, I wrote the book, I, I, I wrote a draft and, you know, showed it to some people and they thought it was funny, but not really put together that well. And I, then I had to rewrite it. And then I eventually, you know, came up with a draft that was good enough to get an agent. And then the agent believed in it. And we shopped it around and, you know, all these publishing companies said, yeah, it's pretty entertaining, but you know, you're not, you're no, but you're not Anthony Kiedis. Like, right. why would we just publish your book of, uh, why would we publish a crackhead's book that no one's <laughs> heard of, you know? So, and I get it. I wasn't even mad. I, 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 that makes sense. You know, Hunter Biden can write a crackhead book because he's Hunter Biden. Everyone knows who he is. No one knows who I am. So they kept saying like, how is this different than anything else? Right. Any other just like nobody drug memoir. So it got me thinking and I talked to some people, especially Michael Schellenberger, who, who suggested, hey, you know, you are kind of an expert, whether you know it or not, on policy. You right. know, what policies hurt you, what policies should have been there to help you. Uh, you should probably reframe this book as a half memoir, half uh, policy critique, uh, mix and then mix in your own suggestions on what policies would have worked. Uh, and probably uh, expedited your ability to nip this in the bud and, and, and you know, 
get off the streets for good. Uh, so that's what I did. And a publisher eventually picked it up. Um, and for, you know, it was, it was a pretty conservative publisher, which surprised me. Right. You know, the, the normal regular publishers wouldn't touch it. Right. Uh, and I'm not mad at them for it. You know, sure. I'm actually, you know, l- pretty lucky that it probably went it, the direction that it went is probably the right direction. Um, the book is not overtly even political. It's not even overtly conservative or liberal. It's, it's pretty just, it's just, just that down the middle. This is what happened. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it will be, it will be framed as a far right book. It, I'm sure it already has to some extent. It's, it's not, it's, if anything, there's a few passages uh, strewn throughout that are, some would call, uh, pretty leftist, I'd say. I mean, critiques of, uh, you know, our economic model and things like that, but that will get blown by and I'll just get called a far right extremist probably, but I don't care. I mean, call you know, I, I think enough people will just view it as an, as a normal, you know, right. The cooler the heads book. will prevail. Yeah. And I think that's, I wanted to ask you a little bit about this. Yeah. Because you are, I think people are calling you that or calling the book that like a far right book because, and right now, I guess, because the left has been so gung ho about kind of bad policies that you critique. And then also, you know, uh, talk about the good parts as well. Like I said, you have a very nuanced take on this stuff that, that people don't give you credit for, but I think because it's useful to the right right now, right? Like, so the right is like being like, Oh, well this guy's, you know, on our side or whatever. And they're kind of propping it up. And then like, how, how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you handle that? Like kind of, you know, do you just embrace the publicity because why not? Right. Like, I mean, whoever wants to have you on, like, you know, if Fox news wants to have you on, why not? You know, it's going to help promote your book and your stuff and your story. Yeah. And, and, uh, well, yeah. The, how yeah. does that work? How do you, how do you deal with that? Sorry. Well, the, the, they're the only ones that will have me on, uh, at this point. Interesting. Uh, it's, you know, liberal outlets know that I, my story and my experience hurts people like Gavin Newsom. Right. Uh, it just does. But, but, uh, but honestly, they're, they're making changes. I mean, the San Francisco right. Chronicle and all these, it's, it's becoming surprise, surprise. It's becoming, uh, n- not a good sales point to be pro destruction of, you know, our cities. That's that, that's actually not working at the polls. So, um, these sorts of outlets I think are becoming more open-minded towards things that I say. Uh, yeah, sure. The, the right is, they see me as, as an asset, uh, because I am critical of, uh, you know, I'm not critical of the policies in Florida. You know, I I actually, I don't talk about them. I don't even, frankly, I don't really know what they are, but, uh, (laughs) I, but, uh, I live here and I'm critical of these policies and I live in a place where Gavin Newsom was the mayor, you know, he, he was the mayor of San Francisco and then he, rose to governor of California and he will likely be the president someday. Right. And, uh, I'm, you know, I talk negatively about direct things that he's responsible for. And, and so, yeah, of course the right loves that and I'll take it, you know, I'll take publicity. Right. Uh, they are not, even if you can be right for the right reasons or right for the wrong reasons, but you know, you, you're right. right. <laughs> you're still right. You know? So if they want to bring me on to talk about it, I'm, I'm not going to lie, you know? Absolutely, um, yeah. How did you get hooked up with uh, Michael Schellenberger, who wrote the foreword to this book in like Leighton Woodhouse? He's kind of like this circle of kind of independent journalists that are that were really focusing on this type of issues and things. Yeah, I, I was on Twitter pretty unaware of these people, uh, but I started seeing some some things about San Francisco and Schellenberger talking about a pathway to alleviating homelessness and addiction, the, the, these epidemics that we're dealing with and, and the mistakes of uh, city governments like San Francisco and state policies in California. And, and it just started to kind of click. And, and I and I started realizing, you know, this guy is sort of saying everything that I'm in support of independently. I didn't know about him. And not only that, I'm a former homeless drug addict. Like we we should be friends. You know, this sounds like a pretty good situation. So I just reached out to him on Twitter and and said, Hey, listen, I was a homeless drug addict in the Tenderloin and on Skid Row. And I think I could, I think we might want to talk to each other. Right. And, and he said, yeah, I think we, we would want to talk to each other. So we started talking and 
he introduced me to Leighton Woodhouse. Actually, did he? <laughs> I think Thaddeus Russell introduced me to Leighton Woodhouse, but Leighton and, and Michael are friends. So uh, it all kind of worked out perfectly. I mean, you know, we're all just kind of on, we were on the same side that we arrived to independently and discovered each other. And, and we're sort of saying the same things. And, and I'm kind of like the perfect exhibit A for his whole philosophy on homelessness and addiction. So we linked up and obviously he has blown up since uh, mostly for other things. But um, he, he's he's very big and uh, he's very very generous to help me out and, and write this forward and um yeah he's been a he's been a huge asset i love that i love that it was just through like twitter like reaching out to like I, I think people very much underestimate the kind of power of that like everyone talks about the negative stuff of social media and sure there's a lot of negative stuff but it's also like you know how would you ever get hooked up with something like that you know you have to write like a letter or something and mail it to them back in the day whereas now you can just kind of like send a send a message or something and you get hooked up with uh something that works out like that i love it i love it I mean, yeah well, I'm, I'm seeing that a lot you know because I, I have a i have a publisher and a pr firm and and uh they're trying really hard they're working really hard but they're sort of like sending emails to interns and stuff and it's just not working and, and i'm just like directly reaching out to people on twitter or in some cases guessing people's emails right and just you know I, people you know you get a letter with like a like a generic one page like we have this book coming out like, would you <laughs> like to speak to this person like i get that's the best they can do i, I and i understand that They're, they can't be me right and reach out personally and say, hey, I'm actually a fan of yours. I've been a fan of yours for years. This is what I heard you say two years ago, and this is how it resonated with me, and this is how my experience directly sort of proves what you're saying or, or validates what you're saying. And, and, you know, big people are going to respond to that much more so than like a generic email that was sent to their assistant. Absolutely. Um, so that that's uh, – that's, it's it just the miracle is like getting them to check their DMs. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, yeah. I definitely feel uh, that one thing leads to another. Yeah. yeah. So it's all very organic the way it starts building and growing. And, um, if you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of heavy board to get complete uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast. Become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. And I'm just on, you know, you just have to be genuine. Right. You know? Yeah. I was going to ask a little bit because we are kind of a writing book podcast about that. Yeah. How that kind of the PR stuff's going. And I wonder, because it is so much of kind of, you have to promote yourself now. It's kind of even like the old methods of promotion and stuff in PR just, just don't quite, like you said, just don't quite work as well because it's an impersonal email or something or a generic one that you're sending out. So it is always fascinating how you're doing. And I mean, yeah, you're, I, I think I heard on uh, Rare Candy, you were, you just went to a Matt McCusker show and just like handed him a copy, right? Like kind of uh, the comedian. No, no I, I, I did that to Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon yeah. I, I gave him a copy. Uh, Matt was someone that I DM'd. You know, Matt wrote a book, and I've been a fan of Matt's for like four or five years now. And and uh, he wrote a book, and and so I reached out to him. I said, "Hey, you wrote a book. I wrote a book. Uh, I really respect you. Would you like to? Would you be willing to write a blurb for the back of my book? If I, you know, I'll send you the book. I'll send you some chapters or whatever. And you, you know, if you if you're into it." that'd be an honor if you're not into it. I totally understand. And, and he was uh, generous enough to, to say, okay, let, let me read a chapter or two. And I, I gave it to him and he said, okay, I, I like this. Send me the whole thing and I'll write a blurb. And then I, when I actually got the book, I, I mailed him the book and uh, out of nowhere, he just talked about it on his podcast for like 10 minutes. And, you know, it seemed like he genuinely liked the book. And, you know, this is something that like a PR for, firm or a publisher, 
Um, first of all, they don't know who Matt McCusker is. Right. And I'm, that's not that's not a that's not a dig at Matt McCusker. Matt McCusker is on the largest podcast uh, on Patreon, right. you know, but he is not famous to like a 60 year old guy that works at a publishing firm. Right. Uh, a 60 year old man that works at a publishing firm would think the best route is like getting on, you know, 60 minutes or something. And, and that's not a bad route either. But that's also an impossible route. It's, right. it's a nearly impossible route. Whereas reaching out to a guy who you're a big fan of that has the largest podcast on Patreon, unbeknownst to anyone over the age of 38, um, is actually much more attainable and has arguably more, more reach, you know, than something like 60 minutes. Um, so yeah, like I'm telling my publisher, like, Hey, I made contact with this person. I made contact uh -huh. with this person. They've never heard of these people. Right. They have no yeah. idea who they are. And, 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 and in a certain way, they're much bigger than anyone that they've, they've heard of, uh, just on an internet level. So, uh, it, it's, it's interesting, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, that's the only reason I wanted to ask about it. Yeah. Cause it is fascinating how it, the market dynamics are shifting drastically in this kind of, you know, internet ecosystem. But yeah, man, I mean, like I said, you heard it here first listeners. You're about, I have no doubt that, uh, Jared, you're going to end up on a lot of these podcasts, uh, Rogan is the big one, right? I imagine that uh, we're going to see you there relatively soon. I, I would hope. I mean, he, we, if you've listened to him, you know that he'd probably like nothing more than to like shit on California for three, yeah. three hours. Uh, not that I'm just want to go and shit on California. <laughs> There's a lot of things I like about California, but you know, he left California because of a lot of issues, and one of them being the increasing homeless problem and and i i think he would love to talk to a guy that was literally homeless in california <laughs> so uh so yeah and and uh you know my publisher knows who joe rogan is obviously right, so they, yeah. they, you know they, they would be open to something like that but um but no one knows how to do that you know i know how to do it it just happens that's how it right. that's how you do it you know people especially podcasts they just welcome people on that they've heard about yeah um it's not like TV. It's not like even terrestrial radio. It's just completely different. Um, it's very organic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I did wanted to ask is, and you've, you've talked about this a little bit. I know it's hard to kind of even explain, but kind of what do you think made you want to get clean? Like, and you've talked about it kind of being a spiritual thing before, but like, you know, you hear all the time people saying <clears throat> you have to really want to do it in order for it to work, right? Or at least for it to stick, to stay sober and stuff, especially from something like heroin, you know? So what was it? You, you've said it was kind of this kind of spiritual drive more than anything that actually kind of happened to you, like an event or something, right? Like it was kind of just like a click moment or something just switched or I don't know, how would you describe it? I know it's hard to even describe kind of. Yeah, what, what got me to you know, I always wanted to stop the last like four years that I was using. I mean, it wasn't before that. It was like, I want to figure out how to stop temporarily or I want to figure out how to manage this. Um, after a lot of pain and a lot of ending up homeless and a lot of, you know, terrible situations due to my addiction, I, I did start to want to stop. Um, but it turns out just wanting to stop is usually not enough to stop. Um, I needed something really, I needed some signs, I, I, I guess. I mean, everything had been taken away from me physically. You know, I, I'd lost, you know, I'd lose my housing, I'd lose my car, lose my job, lose my family, lose all my friends. I mean, I had basically no family left by the end. And most of my friends had left because I just, they, they can't do that. They can't just continually watch you destroy your life and, and support that. So, um, you know, eventually what happened to me was I lost, I, 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 ended up in a place where I would clean up for like a few months and then get high for one day and destroy my entire life. Um, that happened multiple times. Um, so that started happening. And then, you know, eventually I relapsed for what I, it was one of these times where I just destroy everything in one day. And, and I woke up and I was like missing part of my face. I blacked out. I started blacking out a lot. You know, I get high and just wake up you know, eight hours later or whatever. And, and this time I woke up and I had, you know, gotten into some kind of like knife fight with somebody and someone sliced me. And then I had done some damage myself by like chewing on my lip. And, and I was like, they had to, I was like missing part of my face. And, uh, 
and I got really, I was really like infected and I just looked like a monster and, and I went and tried to kill myself because I had $40 and I bought $40 worth of heroin. I wrapped like something around my face so no one could see it because they, you know, people would have freaked out and, and I overdosed in a public bathroom and I actually did die, but, uh, someone, uh, came in and saw like a trail of blood. So they, they called the police and, and paramedics came and they, they revived me. And that was a pretty big wake up call where I didn't want to get high anymore, but I really wanted to die because I had sort of permanently mutilated myself. And, and I was fortunate enough to end up at a non pro or a, a hospital with a, uh, plastic training. I mean, sorry, plastic surgery training department. And, uh, they did plastic surgery on my face and, and fixed my face. And, uh, you can, you know, you, you can notice that I have a scar, but you know, I'm very grateful that they did that. And that almost gave me enough hope to, to think, okay, well, this is just an opportunity that no one would ever get, you know, you can't screw this up. And, uh, I did get high one more time after a period of like seven months clean. And I woke up about eight hours later missing my toe. So this now turned into a thing where two times in a row I'd actually woken up with uh, missing body parts. So, so to me, that was very spiritual. That, that was just kind of a spiritual response uh, to, you know, I, I, I believe in God, you know, and, and, and I just think that, you know, God can take everything from me, everything physical, every, everything like housing and the family and the relationships and the jobs and leave me penniless on the, in, in the gutter and I'll still get high. So, I mean, something more had to be taken away from me and at the, and, and I started losing body parts and, uh, the toe thing was just an unbelievable event where I thought that this was a pretty humorous thing to lose. It's, it's not, it's not, uh, it's pretty insignificant losing a toe, but at the same time it's horrifying and it was just a sign. It was like, I'm going to start taking toes. And once you run out of toes, I'm going to take your feet. And once you run out of feet, I'm going to, you know, it's just, I saw this, I just, this light bulb went off and it was just like you, if you get high, you lose body parts and it's going to be increasingly worse body parts. And, um, Something in that moment just made me become in, in, uh, completely willing to get off drugs and do whatever I had to do. And, and that that really meant just doing whatever I was told by people that had previously gone off, off of drugs. So I, I completely humbled myself and, and opened up my mind to being uh, rewritten. But, you know, my, my, like my hard drive just being wiped and just like, let's start over. I'm not even me anymore. Like I'm just, I need to relearn how to do everything and how to think about things and and uh, basically just followed around ex-junkies for my first year and just did whatever they told me to do. And uh, the th things that they told me to do may not have saved me. I think it was the willingness to do whatever they told me to do is what saved me. Right. So I just became completely like I am a baby and I just do what my parents tell me. My parents being <clears throat> people that had figured out how to get off heroin. So um, that's that's what did it. Yeah, and I, I, that's so like eye opening too. With it, because <clears throat> you hear people say, "Oh, you have to hit rock bottom," and you're just like, "Well, sometimes that isn't even enough." Like you've been like, "I've hit, I hit rock bottom like plenty of times," but then there was this specific kind of within yourself kind of moment, and I think that is something that's another. You know, you said earlier that it's actually kind of degrading to kind of explain it away with a scientific experiment or some scientific terminology or something because it it you know we can't just talk about the brain chemistry about this like it has to be something else and i think that's one of the things it's impossible to study something you know something like that in a scientific way like it, and it's i guess what i'm getting at is that it's kind of just like it's the hardest thing that that people try to explain it away with experimentation or something like that, or, or like, Oh, we studied all these drug addicts and now we know what keeps them on or keep them off. It's like, well, not really because it's, you can hit rock bottom, but you still keep going. And then you have to hit it a few more times, but then even that isn't enough. It's this kind of drive within you, like this kind of, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't know where yeah. I'm going with that, but <laughs> yeah. no, no, I mean, yeah, like you, you know, I know women who, uh, they have children and they're going to get drug tested to, tomorrow by CPS and they're going to lose their children if they get high and they 
have stayed clean, and then for some reason the day before their CPS drug test, they get high, and then they lose their kids. And they're driving to get drugs, and they know as they're driving, I'm going to lose my children, and I can't stop. Uh, you know, that is something that you can't – it's just like – it's hard to, you know, label that as simply a disease. Right. You know, you, it's just – there's something way bigger going on. Yeah. Um, you know, it's complete – self it's just like every move you make is just complete self self destruction in a relatively normal person otherwise right. it's just completely self destructive in this one regard so uh yeah it's 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 something that's really difficult to comprehend and i wouldn't trust anyone that claims to fully comprehend it especially if they've never been addicted to drugs so yeah and the the couple questions that i have there have moved more towards like writing specific stuff who 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 were you trying to channel for this book or who who were some of your kind of writing inspirations that you kind of go to when you when you picked up the pen and started writing your story out and i'm sure there's gonna be many more to come too uh yeah, perhaps i don't i mean i kind of wrote the whole thing i don't know how many more <laughs> i mean i i don't know it, it, I, I i don't want to say that but it's like i just wrote my whole life out so and my life's not that exciting you know <laughs> from when I finished the book to now, it's pretty normal and mundane actually. But, um, yeah, I, I channeled, uh, Kurt Vonnegut. I tried to write like Kurt Vonnegut and people even told me, Hey, this is really corny and you're not Kurt Vonnegut and you got to stop doing this. And, uh, so the, the first version is pretty lame and pretty pathetic. And I tried to be really cool and sound like Kurt Vonnegut and that didn't work. So I stopped and I, you know, I rewrote it and I tried to do like a William S. Burroughs thing and that didn't really work either. And, um, I eventually after many drafts just kind of, I guess, developed my own voice and, and that, that's, that, that is the end result. But yeah, at first it was kind of pathetic and, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of comedians do that too. They, they get up there and they start just imitating their favorite comedian and, and they don't even realize it, right. you know, and then, and it just takes time. It just, it, you know, it just takes repetition and time and crafting and, and eventually you just become you. But before you're a writer, you are just kind of imitating another writer. Um, Were you a big Vonnegut yeah. fan? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved Vonnegut. But, you know, Vonnegut was very smart and very, uh, like, he would, like, directly comment on society and culture, not not even like metaphorically, like right. he would just directly do it. And, and I tried to do a lot of that. And, and I did. And listen, some of it does remain in the book, but um, I just wasn't him. You know, I was trying to be really, you know, he would, he, uh, it just, he, he has a style. Yeah. That just, yeah. I'm a huge Vonnegut fan and we love Vonnegut on this podcast. So yeah, I love hearing that he was an inspiration. Like he, the way he talks about the world too, like the way he writes about it with that kind of, I don't even want to say it's masculine or like a male dominant. It's just like kind of a flat kind of, you know, the so it goes thing, right? Like the yeah. kind of like, just the way he writes about it is very unique. And it, I was the same way when I started writing and, and absolutely just copying everything he did. I want to be him. Like <laughs> I want to yeah. be Vonnegut and have that attitude and that kind of stuff that he writes about in that way. Yeah. And, and then you said Burroughs, were you drawn to like Burroughs and the, and the kind of Kerouac and like the beats and all of that or no, I didn't really read. I read like half of a Jack Kerouac book one time <laughs> about like a climbing a mountain or something. Um, I didn't really enjoy it, but I, I, I liked the book junkie by William S. Burroughs. And, um, I thought it was really unique that this guy was just a junkie. I mean, he, he obviously wrote other books, but junkie is just like, it's literally just a book about him being a junkie yeah. and, uh, and it's really good. So I thought, well, I could, maybe I could do that. And, um, and he was kind of like dry and witty and, and funny. He could be funny. But not it wasn't like a comedy book, but he he knew how to be funny in dark situations. And so, yeah, I definitely channeled a little bit of that. And then, um, you know, I read Train Spotting. Um, God, I forget his name. I forget who wrote Train Spotting. Yeah, the, the Irish guy, right? The, or, or Scottish yeah, guy. Yeah, Scottish guy. Yeah. But, you know, that's obviously like written in. Well, there was also this thing where um, Hubert Selby Jr. wrote 
he, he would write like and make up his own grammar sometimes sort of. So I tried to do that. And, and the editor was like, we can't do that. You know, they, they, they edited a lot of stuff. They, you know, a lot of my sentence structure was like, I don't know how to write really. So like I did do that at first where I just kind of like would put, you know, I'd break up sentences with like lines, like uh, I put like a little, <clears throat> I don't even know, a hyphen line and right. then just like put a sentence inside of a sentence. And I kept doing that. And and they were like, you can't just like do that whenever you want. Like, there's actually rules to that. And and I was like, well, Hubert Selby Jr. did whatever he wanted. And, <laughs> and they were like, well, you can't, you know, you, you this is like going to be a miracle if this gets made. Like, you can't be messing around with stuff like that. And <clears throat> so I, I did, I did that. And then the, the train spotting guy, you know, he wrote where he would like phonetically type or like write out words the way that they're pronounced. So right. I, I did that a little bit. There, there's a lot of dialogue in my book of like street dialogue and like, I, you know, and I did, I do that. I, I didn't know how else to do it. Right. You know, I wanted to sound honest and genuine about the way people talked that I interacted with in my life. And, and, uh, I'm sure I'll get accused of something, you know, <laughs> like, like culturally appropriating speech patterns or something, but right. it's like, you know, what did you want me to, you want me to just lie? Yeah. And you know, I, I wrote how they talked. Yeah. Up until recently, that was very common in literature too. It was known as like a realism. Like you're writing the dialect of a city or you're writing the dialect of a certain type of character or whatever, like the accent or anything, you're writing it in there phonetically. And it, it, that used to just be normal, like accepted. And now all of a sudden it's like, Oh, you know, you can't do that. Yeah, so they're gonna they're gonna give me shit for that, but I don't care. Yeah, I mean, maybe you want me to get like a black guy to come and write pages for me, like for all the black dialogue. Like I interacted with a lot of black people, and and uh, and they talk differently sometimes. Or the ones that I was talking right. to were t talking differently. So I, I just I wrote I wrote the way they talked, and it's not demeaning or anything. It's just how they, they talked, and and uh, right. so yeah, we'll see we'll see where the heck goes. <sighs> What was the process like for you writing something like this? And I mean that in a couple of different ways. Like obviously there's the actual writing that you talked about where like kind of learning how to do this where you're just kind of rewriting and rewriting and rewriting until you get somewhere with it. But like, what was the process like for you personally, especially like, you know, was it painful to go back and re like relive all of that? Uh, you know, did it take something from you? Like, did it affect you in some way? Was it relieving, you know, how, what was the process like for you, for you writing something like this? It, it was pretty relieving and therapeutic, I'd say, and and uh, it helped me process a lot of these things that happened to me, and it, it helped me remember a lot of things, and I had to really dive into my own head and break down exactly what happened in my childhood. I, I forgot a lot of things, and um, there was a lot of moments of like, oh my God, this is going to be like a bestseller book. This is amazing, and then there was a lot of moments where I was like, you're a failure and like this isn't going to go anywhere and and the more hours i i mean i put thousands of hours into it and right. um and the more time that went on i kept thinking like oh you've like wasted so much of your life writing this like and it's going to be really embarrassing like you shouldn't tell people about it until you it actually you get a deal and stuff because then it's going to be really embarrassing you know because you're going to tell people that you wrote this book and then it's not going to go anywhere and i mean there was a lot of that and then there's a lot of the opposite and then there was um excitement and i don't know i i i it's like i can't even write like now it's so hard for me to do anything and uh this was easy you know writing this was easy in comparison to like doing my job like going to work you know right. uh it had to come out i guess yeah like it was almost being like drawn out of you like it had to be done kind of yeah, just basically every day I just I'd commit like an hour right. or two to it, and sometimes I commit six hours to it, and just depended on the. And then there were times when I just started writing, and then after ten minutes I was like, "It's not, you know, right now it's not good." Right. And then I just stop writing. Um, yeah, you have to be really patient. Yeah, very long process in that. But I'm always just curious about, yeah, like the kind of the physical process of actually writing. And then I'm always curious about like kind of the emotional and even you say spiritual kind of aspect of it too. Yeah. So how do you, how do you feel about kind of exposing yourself in like a memoir like this, you know, putting your life into a book that people are going to read, right? Like that brings a lot of different things on positive and negative, you know, how, how did you feel about that? Was that, 
you know, nerve wracking or, 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 oh my God, what am I doing? You know? Yeah, I got, I got scared about certain things. I, I, as it started to pick up steam and I started going on podcasts and things like that, I, I was concerned with, okay, you were, you're committed to this now and the world will know who you are. And, and, you know, if this doesn't work out, you are probably not going to get certain jobs ever again. And, and, uh, you know, you're not going to, you know, I, I worked in visual effects for TV for a while and, you know, I, I figured if I ever get laid off and have to get a new job in that industry, I'll, you'll, I'll never get it. I mean, people just Google my name and, you know, it's, it doesn't look good. Uh, now it looks a little better cause there's actually a book, there's like a published book. So that, that helps, that helps legitimize it. But before it was just me, there was just links about me being a drug addict, right. you know, and nothing, no book, you know, so, um, it's a little less scary now, but you know, this is what I'm committed to. It's scary. I mean, cause you know, you write a book and it's not like you don't have to work ever again. You know, right. even if, even if my book is successful, it's like, what do you think it's going to make $2 million? Like it's right. not. So it's like, you have to have a job. Um, so it's scary. You know, I don't think I'll be getting a job working with like higher end clientele or anything that would be wary of hiring someone that has a history of crime and, and addiction. I don't know, but you just have to, you know, do it. I, I got really nervous about going on Fox News the first time. Right. Um, I figured that I was going to lose my job. Uh, they didn't find out. No one that I, no one at my company watched Fox News or the ones that did didn't want to, couldn't admit it. So even if they saw it, they couldn't admit that they saw it. So that kind of saved me. Um, but now with new jobs, it's like, yeah, they they Google my name. They're going to see that I was right. on Fox News and, and I live in a place where uh, people might want to kill you if they found out you were on Fox News. So um, I don't know. We're just going to see what happens, I guess. Right. One of the questions I always ask, and I guess this is a good way to ask it now, is because we're kind of a writing podcast and stuff, I always ask writers when they come on, yeah, how do they make a living with that? And you said you have to have a day job, right? You have a day job that you're working regularly, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I When I wrote the book, I, was, I did construction. I did construction for a long time. I was a carpenter. I think in 2021, I got an opportunity to at like an entry level job in visual effects after I did some nighttime studying of visual effects and I ended up actually moving into like the production side and I did that for a few years and then the writer strike happened and which fucked everyone over and now I'm now I don't do that anymore nor nor does I mean it's just that it, it, the strike destroyed that right. uh, the strike 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 themselves out of a job so you know I I predicted that immediately and now a lot of people don't have jobs so <laughs> so uh yeah. I work in uh, property management now, um, just for like a little company. Right. And uh, it's not like a long. T I, I don't know. I I don't foresee it being like a long term career. I mean, visual effects would have been like a lifelong career, but and hopefully it'll come back. But right. you know, when when the writers went on strike, I think the studios realized no one canceled their Netflix subscription and that these writers were writing bullshit and garbage. So uh, no one cared. And now it's over, but they're, the studios are like, we're not going to dump a, you know, Netflix isn't going to dump a billion dollars into garbage anymore. So, uh, you know, a lot less people have jobs and, and, uh, including me and most of the people I know in visual effects, uh, lost their jobs and right. still don't have their jobs. And it's been a year. So, um, I've so been... thank you writers. Thank you writers <laughs> of America. Uh, I hope you're happy. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot of that. And obviously, I'm not involved in that <clears throat> industry so much. But just because like a writer, I'm, I'm curious about all that. And you know, the different facets of writing and yeah, production and stuff. And I've been hearing more and more of that. So many people are out of work now. And you think yeah. that it's done. And it's but yeah, but I like that. I just think they like deserve this thing. It's like <laughs> what, you you made six figures writing She-Hulk for four years. Like you right. think you want more? Yeah, you, that you was have the a fake dream. Job. Like, yeah. Your job is fun. Like you people make a, less than half of what you make to like dig holes all day. Like yeah. what, what do you what do you want from here? Like you know, I, I don't know. My my uncle's in the writers' guilds. Uh, to retain health insurance. I mean, he wrote like in the '90s, but um. Right. You know, he it, it's 
I don't know. I'd be happy to make six figures and write bullshit. Oh, you're telling me. Yeah. I think everybody listening to this would, <laughs> would love yeah. to be able to do that. You know, it's a lot better than making zero dollars not writing anything, which right. is what a lot of people are doing now. So um, whatever. I'm not super educated on that. I, I know that, you know, there was a world where like you'd write three episodes of Friends and then you just got to live in a mansion for the rest of your life. Right. And that world doesn't exist anymore. And people were, I guess, upset about that. Or, you know, I, I don't know. But, you know, writing became like a, hey, you're only going to, hey, guess what? You're only going to make 110 grand now. Right. You know, and people were like, not happy. I, I don't know. I don't know the details. I know that there was like AI components to that strike, right. which makes sense. I get that. But, uh, you know, I literally, uh, you know, claw my way through. I, I'd, I'd kill to, to, to just get paid to write some shitty television show. <laughs> Same, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so good job. You know, now, like, I know people that are like on the verge of committing suicide and like right. they've lost their house. So right. like, thank you. The writers of She-Hulk. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the way that we're treating writing now to even books. Like you said, like, Oh, everybody sees you. Even if your book is listed and you, you know, you get all this opportunity to, Oh, you're listening on New York times bestseller. People think that you're making millions or something. It's like, dude, you're getting a check for like 10 grand once. Like, like that's like yeah, what like you're I, getting out I've of I've made that. $0 like, so far. Uh, <laughs> and I don't care. Like I, I, I know I went in knowing like, Oh yeah, you're not going to make a, a ton of money. And what, what is a ton of money? I mean, what, right. what is, you know, if I made 200 grand off the book, it's like, okay, I'm just poor. I'm still just poor in Oakland. I mean, you can't buy a house, right. you know, you can't even, that's not even a down payment for a house where I live. Um, and you know, there's just whatever. I mean, that's life, I guess, but, yeah. uh, I don't want to live here anymore, but, but you know, my fam <laughs> my family lives here. So I, I kind of, I'm here like helping them with some stuff, but you know, I live in a place where, you know, if you have half a million dollars, you could put it down on a house and then have like a nine thousand dollar mortgage for thirty years. Yeah, and it's like that's just not a book's not going to do that unless you wrote the fucking Bible or something. It's right. not that's not going to happen. Absolutely. So, uh, but I don't mind it. I'll just work. I like right. Working. Yeah, yeah. Where where does the title come from for Crooked Smile? Well, it comes from that event of of uh, you know getting the surgery. I do have a, a technically I do have a crooked smile. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to kill myself for years about this and really guilty, but I don't know. I tried to like weaponize it almost and like turn it into a positive. And <clears throat> I mean, am I happy that it happened? I mean, I, I'm not happy, but it seems like it was necessary for it to happen. And it seemed like it did save my life. I don't know if I would have been able to survive addiction if, if that didn't happen. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it hurts to think about, but yeah, it's kind of, it's like, turning the worst thing I ever did to myself into the only thing that could save my life, I guess. And I, I named it, I named my book after it. Yeah. That's it's fantastic. otherwise a corny title, you know, I thought, it, I mean, I liked it. Yeah. I thought it was an extent the cover as well with it, the crooked smile literally on the cover. Yeah, the, I think that's eye catching. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I like the cover. I'm happy with that. Um, it just, it does come off corny and let, until you read the book and you realize, Oh, there's like a very specific reason for why it's named this, uh, you know, otherwise it just sounds like a corny, like I had a troubled childhood yeah. and now I have a, fr a upside down frown or, wh or whatever, you know, it's just, it, it can be interpreted as corny, but I don't think that's okay. so. I think, I think it's better than, uh, I mean, I guess what was the Matthew Desmond wrote that book on poverty. It was like nickeled and dimed or whatever. I was like, ah, that's a good title, but I mean, Crooked yeah, that's, Smile, decent. that's good. Yeah. That's good. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And the fact that you have the story behind it that you, you learn as you read through the book. Yeah. Great title. Yeah. Yeah. Thank what, you. Yeah. What What is your routine like in terms of writing for for? Because I know you you have a stub stack that you operate. You know, you write articles for other outlets and stuff. Uh, and again, this is you know writing as you have two careers basically. You have your your day job and then you have your writing. What, what's your routine like for stuff like that? Either writing the book or, or right now or. I guess there's just there there's certain times when it when it feels right and I'll just hunker down like a. Like in a like a mentally ill person basically, and like get and I'll get like sweaty and drink coffee and just write, and it's it's really hard, you know. I, I uh, I'm not like the the best person to ask this. I mean, I, I just <laughs> I just it just comes and it's garbage sometimes, and then it just has to get refined, and you just have to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, and and uh, it gets really it's really messy, and um, 
I don't know. I mean, I try to, I write some journalism stuff, but like, I'm not a journalist, you know, I'm, I'm not, I didn't, I didn't go to school for it, which doesn't really matter, I guess. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm not like, I'm not that educated. Uh, frankly, I'm surprised that anyone has let me write an article. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 my life's been kind of rough re- recently, just like with some family stuff and, and I just work, I'm working too much at my day job and like my writing suffers and, uh, it's hard, you know, you oh, gotta, yeah. it just has to kind of hit you when it's right. You know, I, I, I don't know who could wake up and just for a day job, write Eight hours a day. I mean, it just can't, it's just not, it just has to be there. The moment has to be right for me. I mean, it, it, it some people are probably different, right. you know, and they can just, they can just write every day. They can go to the newspaper and to their job and just write stories. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm not like that. What, uh, what advice would you give people that are out there either trying to write something like this or even I think extend this even further in terms of like addiction and stuff as well. What, what advice would you give out to people that are looking to do something like you did either write this kind of a memoir or even something smaller, like just, or not smaller, but just get over an addiction or something. Um, well, if you're trying to write, the best advice I have is to write. You just have to write. Um, and it's going to be bad maybe at first. And, and you just have to keep writing and, and, uh, and keep refining and, and uh, take chances and, and, and reach out to people. And, you know, none of this would have happened if I didn't just – like an idiot, just like reach out to random people. And, you know, nine out of 10 people didn't respond to me. And, and I, you know, I got an agent, but you think it was like the first person I reached out to, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it was hard. And, and, uh, there's people I reached out to three years ago that all of a sudden now they're like responding to me. And it's just like, you know, just be a weirdo and, and, and just, and, and just go for it. But all, but also you just have to write, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just like starting a podcast. It's like, to start a podcast, you have to start a podcast right. and it's going to be weird, you know, <laughs> and it's just, but it will, hopefully it'll lead into something. You know? So, uh, if you're trying to beat addiction, um, humble yourself and do whatever, be, be entirely willing to do things differently and accept that you are not going to solve this. The person that created this problem and perpetuates this problem is not going to be the person to solve this problem. So, uh, find humility. Um, you know, the world owes you nothing, you know, um, you're not special. You're not, you're not terminally unique or anything. Uh, you're, you're a drug addict and, uh, you're not going to fix this. Any plan that you come up with anything, if you, I'm going to move to uh, Florida, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to change my jobs. I'm going to take up hiking or, you know, or whatever. It's like you, if you came up with the idea, idea it's probably not going to work so uh you know listen my suggestion is go to a 12-step program and uh find an asshole that doesn't look fun and do whatever he says you know do whatever he says to do and uh jump in and surround yourself with people that are also clean who have more time than you and uh the chances are if you're hanging out with people that are clean from from drugs you'll probably have a better chance of not doing drugs too um be held accountable when you dive into a group of people that are clean, you are held accountable by that group and you can't trick that group. They will see through your bullshit. And, uh, that's going to give you a fighting chance. Um, if you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of heavy board to get complete uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast. Become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. And just know that it's possible. 
you know, right. you're not, you're not, you're not special. Like I thought I was special and it just wasn't possible. And, and uh, a lot of people thought that too, actually, they thought this guy will never get it. And they were probably right for thinking something like that. But, uh, but I proved them wrong and I proved myself wrong. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, and then the last couple of questions here are just, uh, we like to ask writers, uh, are you reading anything good that you recommend watching anything, listening to anything? Uh, what, what, what do you go to when you're looking for books or entertainment or, or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, uh, I read this book called on perks by Mike Rainey, who's a comedian and, uh, he's not like a novelist or anything, but he was addicted to Oxycontin and, uh, he wrote a book of all his Facebook statuses during the time of his addiction. And then he, at, he would, he'll post a picture of the Facebook status and then write like two pages on like, this is where I was in my life. And it's very, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, just, he's like, this is why I said this, you know, this is what was going on. I was such an idiot. You know, it's like, cause you're an idiot when you're a drug addict, you're like a selfish piece of shit and, uh, you write crazy shit on Facebook. So that, that was genius. Uh, I checked that out on perks by Mike Rainey. Um, I'm reading Eye of the Chicken Hawk. Sorry, I'm gra I'm grabbing. Yeah, it. no worries. Yeah, uh, Eye of the Chicken Hawk by Simon Dovey. Uh, this is a book that chron this is going to sound crazy, but it's uh, it chronicles the existence of an international child sex trafficking network involved in the dissemination of the pederast ideal. Uh, it sounds like a QAnon book. It's not. This is completely separate from QAnon, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I, got, I read a book called The Franklin Scandal about this like child sex trafficking network in, in um, Iowa in the 80s that was connected to the uh, George H.W. Bush administration. And, and it was just fascinating. And obviously that predates QAnon. So this isn't like crazy conspiracy stuff. But this book sort of expands on that. And um, but, the, you know, it's become scary to talk about that subject because then people just assume that you're nuts and you think Oprah like eats babies and stuff. But it, this is not like that. This is a real journalistic book. Um, I barely have any time to watch television, uh, but man, what the hell am I watching? I guess I'm watching Shogun. Yeah. Shogun's that's pretty good. good. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Nothing's really knocked me away writing wise on television besides succession i don't have yeah. to recommend that we all know that oh yeah um any reality tv yeah. or anything that you just zone out to or not really i mean i always love cold case files and all that oh, yeah. um i thought the fall guy was good it's a movie it's like a dumb action funny movie and it made me feel really good i thought that okay maybe movies are back there's no messaging in it it was just a movie uh, it was just a fun two hour movie, zero political messaging. Um, unfortunately it didn't perform that well, although it, I think it was rated highly. Um, I saw the bike riders. That was oh, good. Nice. Yeah. I haven't seen great, that yet. Yeah. Great. Uh, really great performances by the, the lead actress. I forget her name. Um, that was good. You know, it's, it was odd. It wasn't, it, it didn't. The pl it wasn't like plot thick or anything, but it was like a character examination of these, the, like one of the first bike gangs, I guess, in Chicago. Um, that's awesome, yeah. Yeah, that's that's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It. We just like to know, yeah. We just like to know what, what's inspiring you right now or what are you interested in right now, yeah. Final yeah. question I like to ask writers that come on. Uh, what are you working on now? What are you? What's taking up your time, your energy? Man, I... Uh, I'm barely writing right now. I, I well, I'm writing. An, I'm trying to write write an op ed right now for uh, after the Supreme Court. I think I think it was yesterday about the cam the homeless camping ban thing. I was going to write like an op ed for that and try to like send it to you know some large publications that will probably reject it. Right. Um, I had this idea for like a paparazzi movie like six years ago that I was trying to start, but then that. Uh, black mirror episode came out last season of it's like I, I i swear to god like i came up with a similar idea before that but and i'm not mad at them <laughs> they, they obviously didn't steal it from me but they just independently came up with that and now i feel guilty i can't like d pursue it maybe it's it's pretty different but it's a similar concept of like the paparazzi 
you know, trying to get the He's trying to get a picture of a celebrity, and it, it's very similar. It's like eerily similar. So I, I don't know if that will ever go anywhere, but uh, that'd be cool to, to write that. It's a little, it's a little different, but it, it was a blow when I saw that. Yeah, for sure. I, I, do you do a lot of uh, the kind of fictional fiction writing, like kind of mostly TV stuff or movie stuff or scripts or? Uh, I don't. I haven't yet, but I, I really wanted to do this script after the book but I kind of finished the book right around that episode <laughs> and I'd have to really like work. I maybe with someone I could work on it to like make it a little different. It, it just, it, it was eerily similar. Um, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't know how to write a script. It would just be a complete experiment. Um, I'd like to go in that direction after the, if the book does get any success and I get labeled a writer or a professional <laughs> writer or whatever, I'd, I'd love to get into like uh, writing a script or something like a fictional script. Oh yeah. But, uh, you know, this, like there's Jerry Stahl, you know, Jerry Stahl, he wrote yeah. Permanent Midnight and like, you know, I don't know what the hell that guy, I mean, that I like, you know, that was great, but I don't, have you reached out to him at all? He'd probably really like your book, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I did reach out to him years ago. I, I don't think he's going to like my book. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> um, there's just people that are not going to like my book. Uh, cause I, I'm, it's kind of a hard ass approach to this and, right. and I don't, I don't, I don't know if he's into that, um. Yeah, I know. Oh, Irvine Welsh. Irvine Welsh wrote Train Spotting. I don't think he's gonna. I looked at his Twitter timeline. I don't think he's gonna be a fan of my book. Um, <laughs> so, but that's fine. That's okay. You know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's just. It's always funny to think about. Yeah. Well, that was all I had, Jared. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on here and, and sharing all this. It's been great. Yeah, thank you so much. It was an honor to come on. I had a good time. And uh, yeah, anyone listening, you know, but if, it, if that sounds interesting, what I just talked about, you know, pick up the book. Oh, yeah. And it's linked below, listeners. Go click that link and buy it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. This has been another episode of Heavy Board. Heavy Board. I am heavy, heavy, heavy board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.